Uh, so today we have Professor Carlos Stroud of the Institute of Optics of, uh, from U of R. And his talk is called the Institute of Optics as it approaches its centennial. And uh, I'll, I'll just read a little bit of biographical stuff about Carlos. Uh, he, he has uh, a PhD from Washington University in physics. And he is a professor of optics and physics uh, and the director of the Center for Quantum Information at the University of Rochester. He's a fellow of both OSA and uh, the American Physical Society. And his research interests have been uh, over, ranged over most of theoretical and experimental quantum optics. But he's here today because of his, uh, his keen interest in the history of the Institute of Optics. Um, he's responsible for editing this massive book about uh, called A Jewel in the Crown, which is a collection of 75, I think, essays about uh, the Institute. Uh, that was published in 2004. And since then, in last year, uh, they've come out with A Jewel in the Crown 2, which updates it. Uh, so, so therefore, the, the 2004 was in honor of the 75th anniversary and the 2020s, 15 years later, for the 90th anniversary. And uh, so Carlos, I'm sure, is going to have a lot of interesting things to say about that as we approach the 100th. So um, as usual, I think we'll, we'll um, w hold questions until, uh, until the talk is done. You can certainly type them in in, in the chat, and uh, we'll try to keep track of them and ask them at the end. And we, we usually just open the mics and let people holler out their questions uh, when we're all done. That that's, hasn't been too chaotic <laughs> so far. So if that sounds all good to you, Carlos, um, I'll welcome. turn it over to you and you know, welcome. It's great, great to have you here. Thank you. Okay, is my screen shared? No. Not yet. There we go. Oh, good. Everyone see that? Yes, great. <clears throat> okay, very good. Um, so the Institute of Optics was founded in 1929. It's coming up on its centennial in 2029. And uh, as we just heard from Peter, uh, I uh, have the honor and task of recording the history of the Institute of Optics uh, through its 90th anniversary. And that's in uh, uh, the first volume was, I think, 410 pages, and the second one, uh, uh, 230 pages. So, so we've got uh, something like 650 pages or so of history. Uh, to go through that in 45 minutes is obviously a task, and in fact, did require a little uh, work today, uh, editing down uh, for 45 minutes. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, you can request copies of these books, uh, either one or both of them. You can do it uh, at the email address uh, uh, for me that's on the screen there or through the director's office in the Institute of Optics. Uh, you can see here at the top of the screen uh, the four buildings that the Institute of Optics has occupied since 1925-29. It started in the uh, Eastman Hall down on the uh, uh, downtown campus of the university. And then in 1930, he moved out to the river campus uh, where the top floor of Bosch and Lohm Hall was built uh, to accommodate the new Institute of Optics. Then uh, Duncan Moore helped us move all the labs over, supervised that moving into Wilmot building uh, uh, and I think it was 1979, 78, I guess. And then uh, more recently, we've built uh, onto that another uh, 100,000 square foot addition that we're sharing with biomedical uh, optics. So that the Institute of Optics now occupies a footprint of roughly uh, 80,000 square feet. <laughs> Uh, let's go back to a little bit of the prehistory 
to set, set the scene. Modern optics, as most of you know, really started in Jena, Germany in the middle of the 19th century. It was pioneered by Carl Zeiss, uh, Ernst Abbe, and, and Otto Schott. And uh, in 1850, a young German optician's apprentice, John Jacob Bosch, immigrated to Rochester soon after, followed by his friend Henry Lohm. And they started an eyeglass business and were soon making microscopes as well. By the 1880s, there was really a, a small number of different optics companies in Rochester, mostly started by German immigrants. Uh, things were a little chaotic in uh, Germany as it was unifying uh, in the uh, mid late uh, 19th century. And so there were a lot of immigrants. And that time Rochester was the boom town uh, that you could come across on the uh, canal. And so lots of them came to Rochester. By 1900, Bosch and Lohm was selling 20 million pairs of eyeglasses, and Eastman Kodak had introduced its first Brownie camera. So things are rather different from these small companies that had started before and from the American Optical that was over in Southbridge already. Uh, because 20 million eyeglasses is a whole different thing. And of course, Eastman Kodak's Brownie camera started something else entirely, and that was consumer optics really consumer optics because uh, we now soon had a uh, Kodak moment in every home. I remember being 30 years ago in a small village in uh, Pakistan and being uh, pleased to see that yellow Kodak sign in the window of the shop there. It was all over the world and Bosch and Lohm spectacles really flooded the entire world, it made it possible for, for common everyday people all across the world because they could afford those uh, vulcanized rubber frames that uh, Bosch and Lohm had come up with. So this is a different kind of animal. It's really 50 years before Silicon Valley, the Genesee Valley was, uh, was the, the really hotbed of new things going on uh, in consumer optics. World War I then came along and it changed everything. Suddenly, the supply of high quality optical glass and instruments and trained engineers was no longer available. At the beginning of World War, II, World War I, there was no op source of high quality optical glass in the United States. It was imported mostly from Yana. Uh, and of course, there was a slight problem because by the time World War I, uh, came along, we had uh, airplanes flying around in the war. They needed high quality optics. And also we needed high quality optics on the ground to try and shoot them down. Also the uh, cannons and the uh, ships were now machined to such accuracy that they could accurately uh, place a shell 10 miles away if they could aim it properly. So we needed op high quality optics, range finders, and so on to enable the ships to take advantage of this new, these new cannons. Well, France and Great Britain, of course, felt similar pressure, and they founded their Institut d'Optiques in the optical section of Imperial College. By 1917, George Eastman had already approached the University of Rochester President Rush Rees about founding such an optics institute at the university. Eastman's idea about this was that the optics industry was just too big to, to gamble its future on the uncertain transatlantic ties and the European uh, uh, suppliers. So we needed local sources of glass, we need local sources for training people, and we also needed professional societies so that the people in local uh, uh, optics industry could interact with each other with people across the country. So the Optical Society of America grew out of that effort and JOSA uh, was, came along a year later. This all grew out of a meeting on campus at the University of Rochester in uh, December of 1916. Uh, so everything really got into motion here as just as the US was about to enter the First World War. The uh, Eastman, along with uh, 
uh, the head of Bosch and Lohm actually wrote a letter to the University of Ro Rochester, asked them to set up an optics institute there for training their uh, employees and potential employees. The uh, Institute of Optics didn't get founded quite that quickly. Uh, the University of Rochester was, of course, involved with the war effort, but also with building a new campus out uh, out on the outskirts of town, the, what's presently the river campus. And so uh, Russ Reeves also found he couldn't hire a competent faculty in the United States. You might have thought that there were lots of people who'd studied optics uh, in the United States by that time. There was R.W. Wood and so on, all the famous people. But uh, the American Physical Society at that time and most physics departments were really emphasizing not applied optics, applied physics, but fundamental physics. And the new quantum theory was being developed. And so there was great motion in that direction. So really even uh, uh, the, the uh, physical review was uh, discriminating against applied optics uh, papers. So there was a great need for professional society and for training people in applied optics. So uh, there was a promise from Kodak and Bosch and Lohm of 10,000 each for equipment for this new uh, institute and 20,000 from each of them for five years for operating expenses. And $220,000 is a lot of money in 1929. Of course, it was a small part of what uh, Eastman donated to the University of Rochester, approximately 30 million that, that he ended up uh, giving to the university. And of course, he also was a secret donor that helped MIT get on, on its way as well. So that's how the Institute of Op Applied Optics got started in the university. And uh, Rush Rees took a ship over to England to where he knew that there were uh, uh, people working applied optics who might be suitable faculty. And he actually hired uh, Maurice Taylor, and Rudolph Kingslake. And they came over to the new Bosch and Lohm Hall uh, facility in, in 1930, and the Institute of Optics got going. And uh, shortly thereafter, o Brian O'Brien was hired, a third faculty member was hired to be, and he was soon the first director of the Institute. Brian O'Brien actually discovered vitamin D enrichment of milk by UV irradiation. And actually, the last time I looked over in the fourth floor of Bosch and Lohm, they actually had around some of the piping that went through the floor up to the radiators, these little, little uh, hoods that, that went around them. Those were to keep the milk that was spilled on the floor from running into the physics department down on the third floor. Uh, he also studied the ozone layer. There were high altitude balloon flights going up uh, in 1930s. And he was more than anyone else responsible for the growth of the new Institute of Optics. Here's a photograph of him uh, with Carl Bosch, who was CEO of Bosch and Lohm at the time. It was actually taken by Ansel Adams. That's actually in the first volume of my book. In the 1930s, the ties were kept up with Kodak and Bosch and Lohm, and there were preparations made for uh, uh, being the center of optics research in the coming war. Uh, in fact, uh, O'Brien was uh, clever enough, foresighted enough, he realized there would be shortages of various materials, and he uh, stockpiled in the attic of Bosch and Lohm a great deal of aluminum materials, uh, brass rods, all sorts of materials that he knew he would need for making optical instrumentation during the war. And sure enough, uh, some 50 employees were soon uh, working in a secure area on the fourth floor of Bosch and Lohm as well as up in the attic. And they invented a whole series of things that were instruments that were important in the war effort. Uh, notable among them is shown here uh, with Brian O'Brien looking through the Icaroscope. This was a clever device that allowed uh, someone to look into the sun where a 
an approaching dive bombing uh, airplane was coming down uh, onto a ship. And to image that, uh, uh, that uh, airplane coming down in spite of the bright sun. This was done by a phosphor that was exposed by the bright image, but uh, saturated by the sun and then not saturated where the airplane was. And then this was flipped over for you to view afterwards. And it flipped back and forth between, between the two. Uh, also the first uh, infrared uh, uh, viewers were developed uh, in the Institute by Franz Urbach, who uh, was a refugee from Vienna uh, and uh, uh, came over up in Rochester and he uh, invented the first infrared viewer. There's also these corner cubes which weren't invented in Rochester, but they were actually uh, uh, proposed and used evidently uh, for uh, devices for co marking covert landing strips uh, behind enemy lines uh, in North Africa and in Europe. Uh, so a, a series of these, half a dozen of them could be uh, uh, sneaked into a country in the lining of an of a overcoat and then set out along a landing strip. The pilot in a small plane could come in with no lights on the ground and none on the plane except for a little flashlight on the side of the pilot's head. Uh, this was retroflected back by these uh, uh, corner cube reflectors and the plane was able to land. And believe it or not, uh, two employees of the Institute of Optics actually tried this out first at the Rochester airport at two o'clock one morning and they actually landed, landed the plane that was the Institute of Optics airplane during the war uh, uh, there at the Rochester Monroe County Airport. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't on the plane. <laughs> Uh, the, most of the work was uh, classified that went on during the war and uh, uh, I wasn't able at first to learn, learn what it was. Uh, but then I discovered in the attic of Bosch and Loam an old file cabinet and it was filled up with files marked uh, classified, uh, confidential and so on. Um, I obviously couldn't use those in my book, uh, not even really properly read them. Uh, they were 60 years old, so I was sure that it wasn't really a problem, uh, except as a technicality, but an important technicality. Uh, so I uh, submitted them to be declassified, but uh, it took more than a year before that declassification actually occurred. Uh, happily, there were uh, not marked classified a lot of drafts of the reports uh, that were uh, also in those filing cabinets. So I was able to read those unclassified drafts and found out about a lot of the projects that, that went on during the war. And there's a list of them. Some of them, uh, I don't want to read through all the list of them. Uh, I've already mentioned the aircraft landing at night, the infrared telescopes, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, it gives you some idea and you can read these over in the files, uh, uh, the recording of this uh, lecture later if you like. Um, so there's quite a long list, list of these. Uh, one of the fascinating things that also happened during the war was the, um, there was actually a spy novel set in the Institute of Optics that was written during the Second World War that there's a copy of in the uh, University of Rochester Library. So if you'd like to know, know what spy novels uh, in the 1944 uh, genre were like, uh, there is one in the library here. Uh, also, if you see here in the lower right, there is a, um, uh, a ceramic block. This was actually used for sagging glass blanks to make aspheric lenses for, for a uh, aerial cameras that were developed by Bob Hopkins uh, here in the Institute during that time. After the war, uh, work, the uh, Institute continued working with uh, 
the military in various projects. And importantly, a high-speed street camera that had been developed during the war uh, was utilized to take pictures of the uh, first uh, bomb that was set off in the Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. It took a street photograph. There was no, nothing, no other way they had of actually photographing the explosion with the time scale uh, required. Uh, and uh, Brian O'Brien Jr. Uh, personally told me about, uh, he, he put this uh, camera up on, on top of this mast of this ship, which was uh, uh, just uh, a few miles, I forget, five or six miles from ground zero. And uh, he was down, down below waiting for the bomb blast to go off using the dark glasses and so on. But then they saw to their horror, it looked like the mushroom cloud was going to come over uh, and uh, pass over their ship. And he was afraid that the exposed film would uh, be uh, fogged, destroyed by the uh, radioactive cloud. So he went out on the ship and climbed up the mask and brought the film back down uh, to safety. Uh, uh, and, and he lived to, to age 90 or so. So, so evidently uh, the radiation uh, it wasn't too large a damage. After the war, the situation for university-based optics wasn't so good because the classified research was split off from basic research. Basic research was dominated by nuclear particle physics, microwaves, those are considered much sexier subjects and classified research was moved off most campuses. In fact, the University of Rochester uh, classified research was banned on campus at that time. Uh, also, the financing uh, in the National Science Foundation was primarily uh, in basic research rather than applied, so, so they were limited. Uh, the ONR was available and there were some other sources, but the uh, but it was not really possible to keep the huge facility that had been developed during the war going after the war. So Brian O'Brien ended up leaving academia to become vice president of American Optical. But he left a number of important assets for the Institute that kept it going through these lean times. In particular, he left uh, Bob Hopkins, a very capable successor as director. And also he started solid state physics in the Institute which had been over originally in the physics department, but had essentially gone away after the war. And he hired David Dexter, Ken D. Garden, Dave Dutton. Uh, but the Institute of Optics, because of the financial problems and uh, their support by Kodak and Xerox and the, uh, and the DOD actually uh, got into some pretty dire financial straits uh, just in the, around 1960. And uh, the Institute lost its status as a separate Institute reporting the president and became a department in the new College of Engineering and also lost its separate endowment at that time. Uh, of course, 1960 was also the year that the laser was invented. And so optics became sexy again. And the Institute was well positioned to take advantage of this. Emma Wolf uh, had been hired uh, as an expert in coherence theory. Uh, the, uh, Bob Hopkins was convinced that coherence theory was going to be important with the development of the laser. And he looked around to see who in the world was the expert on coherence theory. And he found Emma Wolf over in England uh, who was having a hard time finding a permanent uh, faculty position at that time. Uh, and who had been busy writing Born and Wolf and uh, so uh, uh, Bob was on a trip over to England to a conference and he stopped by, made an appointment with uh, Emma Wolf and uh, uh, hired him to come over and uh, join the faculty in 19, which he did in 1960. Uh, he also, one of his first tasks, he was asked to set up the uh, first Rochester conference on coherence and quantum optics, which, which was held uh, campus on June 1960 and then just in August the first laser operation the visible was named. Doug Sinclair was on the faculty then not as a lens designer but doing a thesis in uh, 
uh, lasers uh, working on the helium neon laser. Amazingly, he uh, he helped Bosch and Lohm develop a, uh, a helium neon laser, which was uh, actually housed in, in a beautiful uh, polished wood case. It's, I think it's the only commercial laser ever produced that, that had a wooden case. Uh, this uh, this picture here has has Doug uh, peering down at the output of the helium neon laser using a Beck spectroscope. I still have that in my office right now. It's beautiful, one angstrom resolution handheld uh, spectroscope. Uh, Mike Hersher then, along with Al Pike, developed the first tunable uh, single mode CW dye laser, and that really started the world of quantum optics. And uh, quantum optics uh, really got going in, in uh, Boston with, uh, uh, over at Harvard and in Rochester. And Emil Wolf soon recruited Lynn Mandel uh, and then Joe Eberly in the mid 60s and then the end of the 60s, me. And the Rochester uh, Coherence and Quantum Optics Group was started. And soon uh, along uh, uh, joining the group and passing through the group were Bob Boyd, Mike Raymer, Ian Walmsley, Nick Bigelow, John Howell. This group really became world leaders with most of the other researchers from around the world gathering in Rochester every six years for the Rochester conferences. Uh, part of the fun and the way we attracted so many good students to work in the field then was dye lasers were so beautiful. You walk into our labs, they were so colorful. The uh, quantum optics labs now and the uh, quantum computing labs are not nearly so beautiful with their infrared lasers. It's all uh, the lights on and generally and uh, uh, no visible laser beams. But it was really sexy in our lab back then. Another thing started in the 60s that uh, really got the modern Institute of Optics going, I think, and that was Brian Thompson was the director and he started the Industrial Associates Program. Uh, and this was consistent with the original mission statement of the Institute of Optics that emphasized its service to industry. In the early 70s, Brian Thompson set up this program and here is a picture of, I think, last year's, uh, uh, the year year before the uh, pandemic, uh, industrial associates meeting. A couple of hundred people gathering uh, for lectures by students, faculty, and company representatives. Approximately 50 companies come to campus twice a year to meet with the faculty, recruit students, and find out about the latest developments. This serves several important purposes. It connects students to industry early in their careers so that by the time the students graduate, both undergraduates and graduate students, they likely know the recruiters and, and a lot of the uh, leaders of the optics groups in, in a wide range of companies around, around the United States and in fact, increasingly around the world. There's also a director's advisory council uh, where a group of uh, of the industrial associates join with the faculty and the director to talk about what the needs of industries, the needs of the institute and so on and try to make sure that the Institute of Optics continues serving uh, industrial optics needs in the United States. It also supplies an important source of discretionary funds that allows the Institute of Optics to uh, uh, start up new new initiatives and to keep faculty happy so they don't run off somewhere else with a big salary offer. Uh, there's also the industrial summer school which which was actually started a little before the industrial associates and that actually has served a significant fraction of all the working optical engineers in the country uh, in, over the past 60 years. Here's a list of topics that are being offered this summer for that course. During the pandemic, we've moved this to uh, online sessions uh, for the most part, uh, and it's likely to continue 
hybrid online as well as uh, in person in future years. There's generally the two, two basic courses that are week long covering the fundamentals for, for those, particularly people trained in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, or, or who are working uh, in management uh, without training in those areas uh, to get an overview of what's going on in optics. And then a bunch of specialized courses, these change year by year, but it gives you here an idea of the wide range of disciplines that are that the Institute of Optics covers these days and offers in our summer school. Due to the pandemic, of course, we moved uh, classes not only in the summer school, but also our uh, regular uh, uh, degree courses online for the most part for the past year. And this experience has really led us to learn much more about how to properly offer such courses. And so it is likely that there will be much more of our summer school sessions as well as regular courses uh, offered online in the future. A more about that a little later in the lecture. Now, initially, the Institute of Optics was the only institute uh, offering applied optics training in the United States. But of course, uh, the field grew too large. The business needs grew too large for one department to service that. And so, so a number of other departments have grown up. And in particular, two large ones are actually colleges of optics at the University of Arizona, the Jim Wyatt uh, College of Optical Science and Creole at the University of Central Florida. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the Institute of Optics played some role in these uh, uh, two departments. Uh, I, I haven't looked at the latest number, but something on the order of eight or 10 faculty members, former uh, students in the Institute of Optics have been on the faculty at the Optical Sciences Center. And in fact, the College of Optical Science is now named after one of our alumni, uh, Jim Wyatt. Uh, Creole, actually, uh, I and, uh, and uh, one person from Arizona both served as consultants for setting up their academic program down there years ago. So it appears that uh, the Institute of Optics maybe is a bit, bit outgrown as a department in optics. And here we have two colleges in our competition. How can we uh, compete with uh, colleges uh, as a department. Well, the Institute currently lists 42 faculty members, including joint appointments, with 22 tenured slots. There are approximately 120 undergraduates and a similar number of graduate students. So it's apparently much smaller than Arizona. But optics is, in fact, organized very differently in Rochester. It's not a separate college, but in fact, there's this whole series of optics organizations around campus that all share uh, students, share courses, and faculty, in fact. The Laboratory for Laser Energetics uh, here is, has uh, the, the largest university-based laser in the world, or the most powerful. Uh, it has approximately 200 staff members. The Center for Visual Science has 30 faculty members. <laughs> Uh, it's joint uh, River Campus and the medical school. Center for Coherence and Quantum Optics includes uh, 12 faculty members in various departments uh, around campus. The Center for Reform Optics is just one of the research centers in the Institute that uh, uh, also involves faculty from other universities, as well as people from industry. And we have uh, large numbers of visitors from industry working in these various centers. The total annual budget for this conglomeration uh, altogether is about $100 million, which is, which is significant by any uh, standard for optics. So it isn't, we're not exactly overwhelmed by our competition. Uh, we're, we're right in the game. We're just differently organized. Uh, but we'd be happy if you'd uh, donate some money to put all this together into a college of optics here, perhaps. Optics in Rochester, of course, is very much 
uh, a part of the whole thing in Rochester as well. It's not all on campus. There's some 80 companies in the Rochester area uh, working in optics, photonics, and uh, imaging. And many of them, of course, were founded by our faculty and alumni. Duncan Moore and his staff have put together a list of more than 230 companies that have been founded by our faculty and alumni over the years. So the influence uh, by the, of the Institute of Optics on the optics industry in the country really has matched up to our, our original uh, goal and when the department was set up. And it's attracted some attention uh, nationally uh, as well. Uh, here is uh, Biden announcing the uh, $600 million AIM Photonics Manufacturing Center in Rochester. The center is up and running and world-class fabrication capabilities. As I mentioned to uh, Jeff Heck earlier, I think that this platform of putting uh, integrated optics on uh, silicon may well turn out to be the platform that wins out ultimately for building the quantum computer. Uh, I could be proved wrong, it's still early in the game, but right now, uh, if I had to put money on it, I, that would be my bet for the winning platform. We've also gotten some accolades and name dropping, I have to mention. Uh, of course, Donna uh, Strickland and Gerard Maru uh, shared a Nobel Prize for work done uh, here in the Laser Lab and the Institute of Optics. This was actually Donna's PhD thesis <clears throat> developing what was then called the uh, uh, T-cubed laser, is now called the CPA uh, laser, uh, or pulse amplification laser. Uh, and that won the Nobel Prize two years ago. Donna is just the third woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, Donna's PhD thesis was developing this uh, CPA laser system but it wasn't quite enough to get her a PhD in optics here, actually. Uh, at that time, I, I was chair of the graduate committee and I had to tell her that the university dean for graduate studies would not allow building instrumentation by itself to be a, a, a PhD, that you had to do something with it to, uh, for that. And so she went ahead after she had done this and carried out some groundbreaking work in uh, multi-photon ionization with her new CPA laser. Uh, that's hardly the only uh, name dropping around. Uh, uh, if you look in this uh, second volume of the, uh, uh, of the Institute of Optics History, uh, Jewel in the Crown II, you'll find photographs of uh, Duncan Moore with the Emperor and Empress of Japan and uh, you will find uh, in the first volume a picture of uh, Emma Wolf uh, receiving a honorary degree from the uh, Queen of the Netherlands uh, and on and on uh, these uh, honors and accolades. Uh, in fact, we now have a five page uh, spreadsheet just listing the honors of the current faculty in the Institute of Optics uh, it, it's, it's truly amazingly talented and recognized group. The future, uh, we've still got 10 years to the centennial and we've got a director, uh, Scott Corning, who's uh, got big plans for that 10 years. Uh, he's already worked uh, uh, and made some big uh, contributions the undergraduate enrollment has been uh, raised to about 60 per year for each class. The MS program uh, is currently about uh, 35 per year and on its way up to 100 per year, partly due to the new program, uh, which uh, the home program, uh, which is a new uh, hybrid program. Uh, uh, MS program where you can take all the coursework, regular classroom coursework remotely uh, and then come to campus for three week sessions to take laboratories and 
interact with the faculty and the students around uh, during that. Those, those have been approved and that program is starting out uh, this coming fall. Uh, there's also plans to increase the mass, the uh, uh, industrial Pro associates program up to about 100 companies. There are currently approximately 50 companies in the in that, and it's growing rapidly. There's a bunch of other plans that uh, uh, Scott has. He's certainly not short on plans and ideas uh, for the future of the Institute of Optics. Uh, I'm not sure I know them all yet, but uh, certainly uh, these are not ready for public release, but, but stay tuned, you'll hear about them. Uh, an important step was direct recruiting of undergraduate, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> was approved. So <coughs> because students out in high schools have not heard of optics as a major. So it's very hard for us to uh, get students coming directly to the Institute from high school. We'd have to instead steal, steal students from other departments. Uh, but now we're allowed to go out and directly uh, uh, recruit in high schools. I just signed off uh, today, uh, autographed a bunch of copies of Jewel in the Crown to hand out to prize winners uh, around the Rochester area of promising new students uh, uh, who, who are outstanding science students in, in their uh, uh, programs. There's also a new Nicholas George uh, chair that's just been appointed. That's the latest chair in optics and that's Susanna Marcos who just joined us along with her husband. <coughs> and uh, she's the first Nicholas George professor of optics and also David Williams director of the Center for Visual Science. We're very pleased to have her. It really cements the ties between the Institute of Optics and the Center for Visual Science. Uh, David Williams, who is on our, also on our faculty, was the 30 year uh, chair of the uh, Center for Visual Science and his replacement also is a chaired professor in the Institute of Optics. So it keeps the ties between medical optics, the hospital and the Institute uh, uh, tight and also brings an amazingly talented new uh, woman to our faculty. Uh, we're really pleased to have her join us. So the last, uh, I see my 45 minutes is up. The uh, last question I always get from people otherwise, what's the weather like in Rochester? Well, here's a photograph that a friend of mine, Jim Montanus, took last night in downtown Rochester. So you can see things are pretty rosy here. I'm open for questions. Uh, happy to have any questions, comments, or whatever. Thanks very much, Carlos. Uh, does anybody want to just speak up with a question? Hey, Carlos, great to see you after so many years. Um, <laughs> Glad to see you, Morty. Uh, great. Quick question. So you painted this picture of kind of after World War II, the Institute were went down, it wasn't sexy. Then the 60s, because of lasers became, optics became sexy again. So mm -hmm. where are we now in that cycle? Uh, I really, you know, I, <clears throat> when, when we were raising money for this uh, addition to the um, uh, Institute of Optics, the, the new uh, Gergen building. <clears throat> I was asked to make a presentation uh, to Bob Gergen to try and uh, convince him that he should put his money into building this new building for optics and biomedical engineering. And I told him that I really didn't, that optics had, had really dominated the uh, last couple of decades in the uh, uh, 20th century, but I didn't think he'd seen anything yet. And so I went on to things like quantum computers and mentioned the possibility that maybe we would coherently control nuclei, that we would reach into, uh, into biological systems with optical tweezers and manipulate DNA. I, I think we can go on and on with these. 
And I didn't even start to dream about things like uh, things that Chun Li Guo is doing now, modifying surfaces to change their surface properties from hygroscopic to uh, hydrophobic and such things, or uh, the work that uh, uh, Wayne Knox is doing now on directly writing to uh, uh, lenses of eyes with a uh, femtosecond laser pulse or the work that's going on in the laboratory for laser energetics now uh, compressing matter down to the sort of densities and temperatures at, that is, occurs at the center of big planets like Jupiter uh, and Neptune or even like the center of stars so that we could really study states of matter that, that had not been accessible to people in the past. So I think astrophysics is going to learn a lot from, from this. So I'm really enthusiastic. I, I think it's going to be even sexier and bigger in this century than the last one. It's too bad that I, uh, uh, I got too old for all of this and had to retire last year. Thought I was very pleased to retire just before the pandemic, so I didn't have to learn to teach all my classes via Zoom. Uh, David Lee's posted a question. Uh, he, he wanted to know how many PhD students there are these days, and I would add to that how many how many get awarded each year. Uh, the number hasn't grown as fast as we'd like. It's up to about fifteen or sixteen per year now, something like that, uh, that are awarded every year. I think the incoming class was just under 20 this year. We have had a couple of classes as big as 22 or 23. Uh, we're still limited by the tenure line of the faculty in the Institute of Optics uh, and so on. As a department, we're not allowed to grow too much bigger than other departments in the College of Engineering. So that limits us a bit. Yeah. And another sort of topic, uh, have you noticed over the last few decades um, trends of, of applications? Like, I mean, I sort of have this perception that biomedical optics is, has grown a lot in the last 10 or 15 years, but do, do, you, do you see things like that? <clears throat> well, things have changed pretty drastically over, I used to run the graduate uh, committee back uh, for 20 years, I guess, up until, uh, I don't know, 2005 or so. <clears throat> and back in the days of the telecom boom and so on, uh, there weren't that many other places to study optics in the United States. And we typically got students that turned down Stanford to come to Rochester, turned down MIT to come to Rochester and so on. We were really getting super students at that, that time, uh, competing with everyone. Well, you know, these other departments, Caltech, Harvard, and so on, have, uh, have learned that optics is a good thing to do. And so we're having much more competition, but we're still getting very good students. Uh, medical optics, uh, I, last time I looked, it was like 25 or 30% of the applicants are indeed interested in medical optics. But a lot of the students, we still have the program where students uh, take a wide variety of courses their first year in the PhD program. So a lot of them change their mind. We also have lectures by all the faculty who are looking for new graduate students during the first year. And so the average student changes their mind as to what they're going to do the thesis in the two or three times in the fast first year. So you can't, it, it determines who accepts the offer or what they're interested in, but as to what they end up doing, it, it often changes. Yeah, I was thanks. very disappointed that uh, after working hard to recruit, recruit uh, Donna Strickland to the Institute and get Canadian money to support her, she worked for Gerard Moreau. Shows how, how clever she was. <laughs> So are Creel and Arizona and Rochester still the big three? Is that fair to say? Uh, I think the three of us would say that. Yes, I think that's true. <laughs> okay. There, there are lots of other departments. I mean, uh, 
uh, around the country. Uh, mechanical engineering at MIT started an optics program years ago. Uh, uh, electrical engineering at uh, MIT certainly has a very large optics group. Uh, and uh, even Harvard, uh, uh, Roy Glauber was teaching undergraduate optics a few years ago. Uh, uh, so, and Caltech uh, has, has our alumni working out there, uh, two of them now on the faculty at Caltech. And they, uh, uh, that's the first people in optics they had had since Nick George was on the faculty out there. So, uh, Stanford, of course, has, has always been big. And they've organized a program to sort of look like the Institute of Optics or whatever uh, out there by joining together uh, people from various different departments. But there's lots of lots of departments. Most every physics and electrical engineering department in the country now has a uh, has a, a group that's working in optics. I'm trying to manage these chats. Uh, how how national and international are the undergrads? Yeah, what's the geographical dispersion, whatever you call it? I, I'm not uh, up to date on that, but I, I did give a lecture in the uh, Optics 101, our freshman survey course this past year. <clears throat> and uh, I had um, students that were on Zoom uh, listening to my lecture from Africa and China. And uh, they were up, uh, the ones in China were up, uh, I, I forget, I gave the lecture at uh, one in the afternoon, I think, and they were at one o'clock in the morning in China listening to my lecture. So I, I think the, I would guess the undergraduate uh, students now are probably 20% or 30% non-US. Yeah, okay. The graduate program is, is more, more foreign students, of course. Okay, I see uh, Steve Fantone wants to go back to school. And so he asks, has the qualifying exam changed? And he <laughs> wants to know how long, it, how long does it take to get through the PhD program now? The qualifying exam uh, is very similar to the way it was uh, when Steve, both Steves were here. Uh, the, um, uh, I think it's about to change. Uh, uh, the old guard, uh, Stroud, who ran the graduate program for so many years is, is not there calling shots anymore and such. So, so it's going to change. I think that's good. Times have changed. Uh, the, the possibility that students uh, already know quite a bit of optics before they join the PhD program is much higher now than it used to be. It used to be essentially no one knew any optics when they arrived in the Institute unless they were one of our uh, on undergraduates. So that's changed. And so I think all of this is changing. Also, they were beginning to have so many faculty in medical optics, having so many of our students going into medical optics and so on, that we need some changes are going to be made to accommodate that more comfortably. So yes, it's going to change. Uh, uh, I don't know how I'm deliberately uh, distancing myself a little bit, uh, uh, both from nostalgic reasons and, and to, because I, I think uh, it's time to, for new people to, uh, to have their ideas in, incorporated. So Steve, you and I could never pass the quals anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't think either one of you took your 500 level requirement, did you? I was the last one that didn't. No, we started with 600 level. <laughs> Most of the people don't understand what that is, but. Essentially forced you to take my upper level uh, quantum optics course or, or uh, advanced course by uh, Emma Wolf or Len Mandel. Was that the one you taught with, with Joe Eberly? That's right. For 25 years, Joe and I jointly taught that course uh, uh, he gave half the lectures and I gave half. Sometimes we would disagree on how a topic should be uh, uh, presented, 
and he would give his version and then I would give my version. We didn't ask the students to vote though. Can I ask a question? Sure. When I was in high school in uh, Great Neck, mm -hmm. half a century ago, I got a thing called the Bausch and Lohm Award. Do you still do that? Do you guys have something to do with that? And it was tied to going to Rochester. Uh, it's no longer tied to uh, going to Rochester. I'm happy to say that uh, I won that award, my wife won that award, and one of my daughters won that award uh, years ago. Uh, but uh, but we also, we've started a new award in the Rochester area to juniors in high school who are outstanding in science. And uh, it's, it's called the Carlos Stroud Award, I'm, I'm pleased to say. And uh, that is reaching out to try to be our version of the Bosch and Loma Award. I should tell you I went to MIT instead. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, here's another question. Where geographically do the students end up going? Are there trends? <laughs> Uh, I, I haven't checked in the last year or so, but <clears throat> uh, two years ago, the largest employers for our uh, graduates were Google and Apple and Microsoft, believe it or not. Uh, I don't think that's true this year, but, uh, but they've been big hires in optics. Of course, uh, uh, trying to get autonomous uh, uh, vehicles is part of that. Uh, uh, also virtual reality uh, and so on. Uh, but it's really a very wide range uh, of companies. All right, um, great. Another question. Um, can you talk about the relationship and the history between the RIT Center for Imaging Science and uh, the Institute of Optics? Uh, there, <clears throat> there are a couple of faculty members in the Institute, I think, are on the board out there, but the interaction has uh, never been as much as it uh, probably should be. I have not been involved directly at all. Um, uh, they, uh, they have a very different academic program. Uh, uh, we are very much uh, more physics, electrical engineering background. There's, their uh, background is more of the photoscience background and such. So, so there hasn't been a compatibility of trading students back and forth. But uh, I hope there is more interaction in the future. And I think it likely that there will be. Carlos, in in uh, in your your uh, history book, you you talked about the uh, woman who was uh, one of the original faculty members around 1930 and in, uh, in physics, and how uh, poorly she was treated. Were there? Can you talk about um, women on the faculty um, beyond her? <laughs> yeah, uh, Jane Dewey is who you're talking about. She's the uh, daughter of John Dewey. And she was the a reader in uh, uh, in uh, wave and quantum mechanics in the 1929, the very first year. She uh, had been a uh, uh, got her PhD from MIT, uh, and then did a postdoc uh, at, with uh, in Copenhagen with Bohr and Heisenberg. And then she came to Rochester. Uh, the fellow she was working with, uh, Russell Wilkins, was um, maybe a bit of a misogynist. And furthermore, she needed a lab built up uh, to do her work that she wanted to do. And uh, they were just about to move the Institute out to the river campus the next year. So they were very reluctant to build the facility she needed to do her work. So she was quite unhappy. She went off to Bryn Mawr 
to uh, join the faculty there afterwards. Unfortunately, Bryn Mawr um, ended up firing her and giving her position to a, uh, to a man uh, in, during the depression. Uh, she ended up at uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds being one of those uh, calculators, uh, uh, computers that they call them women working on trajectories. The Institute of Optics then didn't, well, we had Hilda Kingslake who never had an official faculty position, but who came in the Institute, worked in the lab the first few years. And then as far as I know, there wasn't another <clears throat> until the Second World War, which was only 11 years later. Uh, and at that, uh, that time, we had uh, two or three of them, including one running the, um, uh, the coding laboratory. And she actually developed the first uh, uh, polarizing beam splitter as part of her work during the yeah. second. Yeah. Mary Banner. Mary Banner. Yeah. Banning, yeah. And, uh, and then um, she was not continued on after the war. Uh, we, uh, next faculty member that, female faculty member we had in the Institute, I believe was Susan Hood Walter, uh, who, who's another interesting story. Uh, uh, and it was, it was touch and go. She almost was appointed director uh, at one point. Um, uh, we've been, we've made a whole series of offers to other women recently, uh, uh, and we, we have two now who are chaired professors, uh, really leaders in the department, Janique Rowland, who um, unfortunately was not, was, she was a candidate as president, next president of the Optical Society. She lost the election to Michal uh, Lipson, who's actually the uh, wife of another of our alumni, uh, Alex Gaeta. Uh, and then I just uh, gave you the resume of uh, our most recent faculty hire. We have, I don't know, four other uh, female faculty members in the Institute right now. I think those are the two chaired ones. Thank you. But uh, it's, it's, it's a task. There's a lot of competition to get very, very competent uh, female faculty. And there's also a problem <coughs> that uh, a lot of them come with two body problems. And so you have to have two positions. And often the uh, spouse is not a uh, optics faculty member. And so you have to get another department to agree to give the spouse position and so on. And uh, uh, that's very difficult to negotiate with the departments and the administration. And frankly, we haven't had the support we needed to pull that off in a couple of cases. Wow. But it's high on our priority list are more. And uh, <clears throat> particularly the undergraduates, the number of women is, is going up rapidly. Great. I was on mute a little while when I was talking away, <laughs> and so I wasn't able to get across what I was saying. Uh, we've we've got a number of uh, contributions on the on the chat, which I which I won't read there because they're not so much questions as as comments. But I'll make sure uh, that I get them to you. I think we'll get a uh, we'll get a transcript of them, and you know, you'll you'll get to read through them. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have a question or, you know, comments are okay too, if anybody wants to say something. No, going once, going twice. Um, I, I had a question about, I, I saw that <laughs> Rochester starting to uh, start up the, the online master's program. Um, University of Arizona has had that for a better part of a decade, more than a decade now. What? I. I get the sense that Rochester wants to be more traditional in its uh, approach and, and its outlook. Can you talk about sort of how, how Rochester is positioning its program going forward towards the future? Well, as I say, I've been trying to keep my hands out of that. <clears throat> Certainly Rochester has been more traditional than Arizona, uh, but Arizona uh, invested a great deal of money in that, kept that uh, online program going for years, uh, losing money. And it's only recently become a very large money raiser uh, source for Arizona. 
uh, we we started playing around with that uh, a few years ago. Uh, there's a big le learning curve. The faculty were not that interested in doing it. Uh, and there wasn't a source of money to underwrite it for several years to get it going. So uh, uh, Arizona certainly beat us out on that, though, though I think the time has arrived now with the pandemic, the faculty are into, into this kind of Zoom presentation, and so are the students. So I, I really think now is the time to really jump into that. And the Institute is doing it with both feet right now. It's, it's going big time. I just, I just had one comment about women getting fired in the depression. And in fact, single men got fired during the depression that anyone who was not, you know, maybe that's not true in academia, but I heard many stories of, from, uh, you know, friends, you know, that one day everybody would get called in and, you know, married men kept a job because they had a family to support. So um, there was a certain amount of sexism in part because women were more likely to have, not have a family or more likely to have somebody. Um, my graduate advisor's mother, as she put it, lived in sin for seven years because she would have lost a job as a teacher had she been married, simply because during the depression, she would have had a husband to support her, but in fact, she was paying for her parents' mortgage. So anyway, a slight bit of history there on women in academia and other things. Um, my question is not really a question, but one thing that I brought up sometimes in our group here is that I think we're seeing fewer people who identify as being in the optics. You know, they identify as being in biomedical physics or, you know, self-driving cars or something else. Um, you know, a lot of your comments sound like that and that you're seeing restructuring. You know, do you see people coming in identifying as an optics person and leaving identifying as an optics person in a very general sense? Or are they kind of channeling in a, a kind of a sub or a very specific division of optics or, or physics? So. Uh, I, I think it depends very uh, much on which of the programs we were talking about. The bachelor's degree program, uh, uh, they're pretty naive and don't know much about any of those. And uh, the <clears throat> master's degree program tends to be pretty direct and usually tied into particular kind of job and areas. The PhD program, uh, very often the student has worked as an undergraduate in some optics group which might be medical optics, laser optics, or quantum optics, whatever, around the country at some other university. And they've heard Rochester is a good place to study this sort of thing. And so they end up applying here. Uh, uh, so the PhD program, it used to be that it was people just interested in optics per se, but, but not anymore because they, they've, optics is applied in so many areas that indeed we get people and these other things. And some of them are resistant to, um, uh, to specializing in optics itself. They, they prefer to stay in their, their little area of medical optics or something. Uh, but uh, we have pretty good sales pitch for why the field is changing so rapidly, will change in the future, getting the broad background that you can get here is one that's hard to match anywhere else. You get specialized little group working in optics in a uh, big electrical engineering department or, or whatever. Uh, so you don't learn the whole range of uh, areas of optics. So we're pretty good at recruiting in that. I think we have a pretty good story to tell, but, but definitely the demographics is changing because optics is spread through so many undergraduate programs and even high school. Uh, we have a high school optics program here in Rochester, as a matter of fact. Hmm. And there are programs Thank around you. for optical technicians, right? That's right. Yeah. The Monroe Community College here has a very big program. One of our PhD alumni is, is head of that program. 
And <clears throat> some of their students uh, come on to the Institute of Optics and do very well in our program afterwards. But that's a big program and uh, is growing rapidly. It's, it's a very nice program. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's great stuff. Um, any other comments, questions? No? Carlos, thank you very much. It was great to hear your story and nice to see you. This is, these remote meetings are, are kind of cool in that way. We probably wouldn't be able to get you to come to Boston to, to give this talk.